good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar of Gerha Center webinar series, The Aftermath of COVID-19, the New Social Impact Ecosystem. Today, we are honored to have with us Isabel Remanozzi. Uh, she has a PhD in education, and she is the convener of the Prime Prime is Principle of Responsible Management Education, and she, this is an initiative, UN initiative, working group on sustainability mindset, and she's going to speak about what is the sustainability mindset. Uh, and on December 2nd, 2020, uh, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres addressed the Global Leader for, uh, Leadership Forum at Columbia University with the following words. We are fighting nature, and this is suicide. Human actions are the cause, but are also the solution. This is our time's moral task. This was an, part of an address called the, sta the State of the Planet. But what is the uh, sustainability mindset? Is it about our morality, our values, our paradigm? Is it about compassion or perhaps spirituality? spirituality? Is it about thinking of ourselves as part of an ecosystem perhaps, or about action, skills, and technology? Now, I would tell you, I mean, Isabel is really the best person to talk about. This. She's a convener of the Prime Working Group on Sustainability Mindset, a network of acad academicians from plus 50 countries interested in developing a new mindset. She has been researching the mindset for sustainability for over 15 years, developing syllabi, training faculty, writing papers and books, and most recently, defining the 12 sustainability mindset principles. Is currently developing the Sustainability Mindset Indicator, a project that was awarded the first prize by the Wharton US Reimagine Education. Uh, I have the privilege of taking two of her online workshops on the topic, and it was really an eye opener. So, without much ado, Isabel, floor is yours, my dear. Thank you very much, Ali. A pleasure. So, um, what we will be doing together in this session is uh, explore, I will share with you a little bit about this research and the work that uh, we are doing in the area of the sustainability mindset. And uh, I always try to answer these four questions uh, when I start a session, no matter how long it is. What is this about? Why is it important? How does it work? And so what? What is the impact of it? Plus, who is in the room? And the who is in the room, if you write into the chat where you're connecting from, that gives us a little bit of a virtual geography uh, visually. So uh, before we start with, uh, uh, with definitions, uh, I, would, I want to invite you to go, oops, sorry, to www.menti.com and enter the code 2022279. And that there is a question there and you enter a word. What is one word that you associate with the sustainability mindset? And that will give us a quick view of where everybody is in, in this call. So go to www.menti.com, enter the code 2022279. And Emma, if you can type it into the chat, so those that are in, uh, entering the chat can see it too. And we will take two minutes, so you get, can go there, enter your word, and then we will share it on the screen. Okay, so if you come up, if you can see it on the screen. Um, Ali, is my screen with the cloud visible? Can everybody see my screen with the word cloud? Sorry, I'm muted. No, we cannot, Isabel. I think you okay. have to sort of unshare this and then share the other one. Okay, sorry. What about now? Yes, we can. 
Okay, good, thank you. So that gives us a little bit of a picture. What is one word that you associate with sustainability mindset? Community, social justice, ecosystem, eco-friendly development, compassion, waste, plastic, balance, continuity, inclusion, unfriendly, maybe, or UN, it could be UN. Environmental friendly, green, water, knowledge, together, harmony, systemic, very interesting. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now well, let's go back to our slides. Uh, the work that I will share with you has uh, originated a number of years ago when I was curious to understand why certain leaders engage in sustainability initiatives without anyone asking them. And I said, if no one asks them to do so, and they are doing it, and they are changing how their organization is operating, why are they doing it? This is Isabel, not do, you, do you mind unsharing this and sharing your... your oh, uh, sorry, sorry. Mm, yes. Mm. Thank you. There you go. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes, perfect. Okay. So that was the, the, the question that really was bothering me. And I say, maybe we can learn something. What these people knew or what happened to them? Why did they change from being a business as usual to becoming a champion for their own organization? And so I started my research thinking that if we, if there would be something that we could intentionally develop, that would be a wonderful a gift for the future, because if we identify what did they know, is there some knowledge that we can share or is there some experience that they have had that we can uh, create or replicate? Obviously traumatic experiences we cannot, but we didn't know. There was no information about that. that, that so that's what I did. My research took place at the Columbia University in New York and uh, what I did is I did a qualitative study of 16 business leaders that were championing sustainability initiatives that re really changed how their organization was working. Most of them were CEOs, presidents, founders, they were at a very high level, and it wasn't a qualitative exploratory study. What I found is that there was uh, what they knew and how they thought was coming together and was shaping and was connecting aspects about their being. And as a result, they changed the way they were acting. So what was inside of this being? I started to identify some things that these people had in common. They were very reflective. That means that at some point they were able to step back from the multiple demands and say, wait a moment, I need to slow down and think about this. Because if we continue acting in an automatic way, we may be missing the larger picture. So they were reflective. They also uh, showed some degree of self-awareness. That means that they were thinking about themselves, trying to understand why am I doing this, which connected with values. They started to explore their values and confront their values with their own behaviors. So they were, would have questions like, you know, I'm a good person. However, I realized that we are uh, um, having a negative footprint socially or environmentally, and I, I couldn't live with that. So they started to confront their own values and through reflection on this self-awareness. Also, these people had uh, mentioned purpose in different ways. Some talked about, I discovered that I want to make a difference in the world and I'm not doing sufficiently, or I was wondering what is the difference that I am meant to, to make? Because here I'm in this big position, I have so much influence, am, am I using this gift of my position in the right way to make the world a better place? So they started to have these questions about uh, purpose. Uh, also, they, sorry, also, they talked about experiences of being one with nature, feeling that actually, you know, we are not separate from nature. I've been thinking we use all these materials, but are we not part of one with nature? So these were very unusual thoughts that I found recurrently in these different individuals. And mindfulness practices. 
uh, which also was an unusual thing. Some people said, well, you know, I just go for a walk. I need to clear my mind and be grounded, not to think of anything. Others were, well, I do meditation. So they were all kind of things because they were traditional business leaders. They were not uh, new age uh, business leaders. So with all these uh, elements, I started to think, what is it that we, I particularly focused on what we could in, intentionally develop to create a, a generation of leaders that have a different mindset. So I realized that in the being area, that was a very important one because about thinking how they thought, yes, they thought systems perspective was an important aspect of how they thought. That was not something new because in different disciplines since the 80s, since Peter Sanger, we have been talking about things, uh, management and systems thinking. But this being uh, area was something novel. So uh, aspects that are related to this being is, was a sense of interconnectedness, thinking about the le uh, legacy, compassion, social sensitivity, also making space for the intuitive uh, knowledge. And uh, uh, as I mentioned also uh, thinking on their values. So with uh, this, I realized that I, the definition of a sustainability mindset was that it was a particular way of thinking and being that resulted from a broad understanding of the ecosystem. When I say a broad understanding of the ecosystem means that no one was an expert in water or in uh, uh, soil pollution, but they had a broad understanding of what this, uh, how this ecosystem was being impaired and how they were a part of it and how they were contributing. So the broad understanding also was accompanied by an introspective focus on their being. That means that they also wondered, how are we part of it? Not just something that is external, but how are we playing a role, contributing maybe unintentionally to the problems, not to the solutions, but to the problems. And as a result of that, they felt the urge to act. So much that they were saying, you know, I cannot not do anything. I just feel this tension inside me, something that you may know, uh, the cognitive dissonance. When we uh, know something and we realize that we are not living up to that and that create a tension in us and we don't feel good. Sometimes it takes a long time until we act and solve, it, or solve that tension. But that tension was a key point for them to say, you know, I need to do something. Even if no one in the leadership team understands what I'm talking about, I need to bring them to the same page. And so they see what I am seeing. We need to do something. And particularly because these individuals were pioneers in their own organization. It's not the same to come into Unilever today and say, okay, what else can we do? We already are doing so much, but they were starting in an organization that was totally 180 degrees going in the other direction. That was what was so interesting for me because I said there isn't a, a gold mine of information there that we can harvest if we can uh, tap into that knowledge, into those aspects and become intentionally as we include it into our teaching. So, um, I, one day I was a, a little story. I was presenting the findings of my of my research at a conference, and there was a person in the audience, and she says, "Oh, now that you have found what these aspects are, do you also have a program, a course to develop it?" And I stood there, and it was, you know, a good time and a bad time because I really had no clue. I had no course. I just had come up with these elements and. I was very happy, but she pushed me to the next level. She said, so what is the course? If you say that all this is to have a course and that we can develop it. So I said, no, I don't have it. And that is always a little embarrassing when you are presenting. And then I went back to her when the session finished and said, why were you asking? And she said, well, because it would be interesting if you had something, we could include it in, the, in our master's program. She, was in the Masters of Hospitality and Tourism of a university here in New Jersey in Fairleigh Dickinson. 
And I said, well, you know, I think I could. I need to work on it, but we have all the, the basic uh, stones to do this. And so she said, okay, do it. And that was wonderful. And to this day, I'm so grateful for her because that was really the catalyst that pushed me to say, oh, how do we convert all this into learning objectives? So I had a bunch of elements that were scattered. I, I, we had the elements, but we didn't have the categories. So after a, a while, I realized that they really fell into four content areas. One is called ecological worldview, the other systems perspective, the other is emotional intelligence, and the other is spiritual intelligence. Now, fast forward, that is like 15 years ago. Now, fast forward, in, uh, I was able to consolidate and create this scaffolding, which is the 12 sustainability mindset principles. I think from the first versions where we are sort of tapping in the, in the dark and saying, oh, we have to develop this and that. Now it is, it is in a better shape today because by being able to define these different principles, it is easier for an educator to find what is the learning outcome that I want to achieve, which is with each of these principles and how can I do it? So to give you a little bit, I will not go in depth into that, but uh, just to give you a little bit of a uh, bird's eye overview. The first two, ecological worldview. What does it mean? Uh, as I was saying before, it's not so much about going in depth into what is happening, what is the landscape in that we are living in. And I mean ecological, both environmental and social, right? Uh, but it is about understanding the breadth, understanding how big this landscape is, because when we see how wide it is, what are all these different areas that relate to Oikos, our planet, our home, where we are living, we really see the multiplicity of our challenges. In, in, other, uh, in other words, if you have been working with the SDG, the SDGs is a wonderful way to see the breadth, right? You may not go in depth into poverty or gender, but by seeing how these 17 areas have connections between them and how influence each other and how they have to be dealt, uh, at least have them in mind. Even if you work on urban planning, you better not forget the other 16, because in a way they will uh, have stakeholders that will be influenced by what you do. So, but this is before the SDGs. So talking about eco-literacy really meant understanding what is going, but also connecting it with our feelings. And that is a very important uh, point. I, I want to quickly show you another, we, can, we will go back to the principles. Um, if you think today, the focus of sustainability education is in the right column. The right column, you see, is the column that is external. So what does it mean external? We can observe it either at the individual level or at the collective level. So what do we observe? We observe behaviors, habits, initiatives, leadership, what people are doing, competencies. So we develop these things with our students. At the collective level, we teach about regulations, innovations, solutions, programs, what institutions are doing, you name it. So the focus of sustainability education is external, both individual and collective. What we are focusing now with the sustainability mindset is the left column, it's the internal column. What does it mean? It's what we don't see. So values, beliefs, purpose, mission, the anchors of our identity at the collective level. What is the paradigm in which we are swimming without knowing like a fish in the water? What are the collective assumptions, the worldviews? That this left column is the focus of the sustainability mindset. I like to give the image of an iceberg where there is a lot under the water that is supporting the little bit, the tip that we see but it is supported by a huge mass of water, of ice under the surface, we don't see it. So is the mindset. The mindset is shaping, it's like a lens through which we make meaning, analyze, uh, make meaning of reality, information and make decisions. And what we see 
this little tip of the iceberg are our decisions, are our behaviors. We see this, we see the regulation, the innovation, the solution, all that we see. So the interesting thing is about the mindset is invisible, yet it is shaping and conditioning these behaviors. Many times unaware, we are unaware many times. So the mindset is only seen in action. We cannot see the mindset like that, but we can develop it, although it is intangible. So let's go back to the previous one. So when I say ecoliteracy in, includes the feelings, that means that because so much is aimed at our rational understanding, we can talk data, facts, research, but when we keep this separate, like a steel plate, separating our head from our rest of our body, we don't get the whole person engaged. We don't get the feelings engaged. It's just a matter, an intellectual knowing. And then we hear, well, people are not so engaged. Well, they are not because what's in it for me? Why is it important for me? I can know that uh, uh, recite by her by heart that this one in six people don't have access to safe drinking water. Uh, yeah, uh, too bad for them. Thanks God, I have my water here. Yes, uh, should I feel guilty that I have water? We, we don't have water problems. I feel badly, but you know what? Can I do? I am not living there. Okay, so it's not related to me. So when it is unrelated, we have this cushion. This uh, like a, uh, it's something that is preventing us from connecting emotionally. And when we don't connect emotionally, emotion it gets us into motion, gets us to do something. All of the people that I studied were emotionally connected to the information. And that's why I say, you know, I cannot live with myself knowing this and not doing something. For that, we have to allow a space for the emotions. The second principle is about my contribution. And that is, how am I contributing to the problems? Mm, am I? No, I'm not. Well, we all are. And until we don't... Uh, realize how we are contributing, we are powerless because our contribution may feel bad, but at the same time is our area of power. When we realize where, how we are contributing, we may be able to make different choices, different decisions, but now we are influencing as opposed to being a victim. Oh, you know, what can I do? This is, this is happening out there. What I, I am too small to to influence these things. Well, that is disempowering. So realizing how we are, today I was talking with a, a colleague, she teaches in Tech in Monterrey, and she teaches marketing. And she said, you know, uh, I have been doing this exercise. I go around the house and look at the different objects and analyze them from the perspective of sustainability to see how I'm contributing to the problems. So she looks at objects in her house and she says, you know, I realize where they're coming from, so far away, so carbon footprint. I realize uh, the packaging that I am part of because there's a lot of waste, I realize. So she starts to analyze the different products that she uses every day. And she was saying, you know, I'm in, I was curious that so many are, have that information written so tiny, tiny that it is hard to see. Being in marketing, she knows how important communication is. And when we type something, we print something so small that no one can see it, it's a, it's a way to hiding it in, in plain view. Anyway, once she was discovering that, she said, you know, I have all these things and I never thought that, my, that I, had all, I was making this contribution. But now she has a choice. Now she says, what are my alternatives? Do I have alternatives and what are they? So when we go into the yellow area, the yellow area is systems perspective. That means how are we uh, analyzing information with a system lens? So basically these four uh, aspects were key in the research that I did to shape a mindset for sustainability. One is the long-term thinking. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't be thinking short-term. It means that we are so much focused on the short term that we rarely think of the long term. And the long term can be next week, can be six months, six years. So it depends on the situation. But what we are trying to see is balance. We want both to be paying attention to the short term and to the long term because the impacts of our decisions today 
will be shown tomorrow and also in the long term. So how are we changing our mental habit to process, the, to analyze information and make decisions? The same is flowing in cycles. So much in our world is about linear growth, right? You go work in any company, we want to grow every quarter. Uh, every country shows you how they will grow in the next uh, year and the uh, next three years. And everybody wants to grow, 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 grow without thinking that in nature, there is not such a thing as unlimited growth. We have cycles. So how about bringing that perspective when we are making plans? The other is both and very important uh, aspect of system thinking. Uh, we are so used to make decisions in either or fashion, either planet or profit. Right. I, either we pay more salaries or, or we pay our shareholders. Without our shareholders, we cannot work. Well, can we work without employees? So we have all these either or false dichotomies. And it is about incorporating this other way of processing where I say, when is it about the both and? And both and are solutions that are more inclusive. The next uh, uh, principle relates to interconnectedness. Interconnectedness is very keen. Someone put it in our cloud already, right? Interconnectedness, how do we realize that we are all connected? Uh, how the whole ecosystem is interconnected? What does it mean? What are the implications for stakeholders? And who are the stakeholders that we are thinking of when we are making a decision? And what are the stakeholders that we are not thinking of? I remember a few years ago, a president in uh, Bolivia, uh, or was it Ecuador? They named the the waters as an official. Uh, they gave him like citizenship, no? like an official uh, uh, legal person, the waters, so that someone can defend the rights of the waters, the rivers. And someone has to defend those rights because it's water, no one is defending those rights. They're defending the rights of the people who use the water, not the water in itself. So thinking about uh, stakeholders like nature, species, next generation, maybe three generations in the future, how are they stakeholders being impacted by the decisions we are making today? Just thinking of it. Uh, in the blue area, we have, uh, in it is the content area, uh, emotional intelligence. For those familiar with emotional intelligence, it is more than these three, but these three belong to uh, the larger concept, the larger area of emotional intelligence. The first one is uh, creative innovation. What does it mean? We have to reinvent everything, basically. And uh, when we get into... Uh, our creative area, we cannot just think logically and following our um, rational mind. We have to go beyond that. We have to listen to our intuition. We have to let go of the logic and try out new combinations. Since we have to reinvent everything if we want to have a sustainable life or planet beyond our life, how are we bringing this creativity? How are we uh, breaking the tacit barrier, self-limiting thought. When I ask, uh, particularly in business schools, I ask people, uh, are you creative? I do a little poll and so many say no. And then we have to explore, what does it mean to be creative? Oh, I'm not an artist, I don't play an instrument. Well, creativity is also in preparing a salad, preparing a birthday party for your kids. Uh, that is also creativity. So we have to, work a little bit with our self-limiting thoughts because we need all the creativity that we can have. Reflection, uh, I mentioned that uh, a little bit uh, before. This is particularly about noticing our pace uh, because we need to slow down. When we go in a fast pace, like every the whole life around us is fast, right? So we adapt, we need to be versatile and adapt and go with the flow. However, when we don't notice the pace we are in, that is the problem. How can we notice our pace so that we choose when we will slow down and say, wait a moment, let's pause for a second. Let's not do the automatic processing. Let's think. And reflection, interesting, is a, it's a principle that has impact on all the other 11. 
because when we pause, then we stop from doing, 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 and say, oh, well, it's like going, uh, stepping out for a moment and looking in from the outside window. That gives us first noticing it, and then it allows us, it gives us a space where we can start uh, 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 with a different way of thinking. The next one, self-awareness, that's sort of a broad uh, uh, title. Actually, it is about how aware are we of the anchors of our identity. When I was working on uh, one of my books, it's called Big Bang Being, uh, Developing the Sustainability Mindset, I realized that much of the uh, what was slowing us down in changing our mindset collectively is that so many values of our culture are unquestioned. And I give you uh, examples of a few. For example, there are values that are very important almost globally, like growth, wealth, comfort, uh, independence. These are all uh, precious things of our culture, right? However, we are not sufficiently understanding the downsides of the way we are implementing it. A growth, an infinite growth on a limited planet is a problem, right? And we are already seeing it. Well, we are, may not be seeing it. We may be closing a few eyes here, but it is something that is happening and we are part of it. So how important are these anchors of our identity? Focus on the having as opposed to the being. Focus on, on achievement at the detriment of other aspects of growing our more spiritual uh, dimensions, which give a balance. I'm not saying this is an either or, it is about balancing the parts that are more neglected. And because they are neglected, we are in the problems that we are. The purple area, we go into the area of spiritual intelligence. And here particularly, there are three aspects that are very easy to bring it up in a classroom and connect it with any discipline. All of these are independent of the discipline that you're teaching. The first one is purpose. There was a person I, I interviewed in my study and he was in his mid fifties. He said, you know, Isabel, I wish someone would have asked me what is my purpose when I was 30? Because I may not have had the answer, but if I started asking that question, I may have started making a difference 20 years earlier. And now I'm trying to catch up. So I said, oh, that's an easy thing. We can ask this question. This is something that we can do with our students. Nothing wrong with that. So starting to ask, why are you doing what you're doing? What is really, what is the difference you want to make? And uh, it is interesting because we are talking at, uh, you know, the expression, the higher angels of our nature, because we are addressing the person with the assumption that you want to make a difference. You want to do something that is good, that you feel good about it. Just the fact that we never talk about it, you not talk, don't talk about this with your friends and with the family, that doesn't make it go away. So by creating a space where it doesn't matter what you're teaching, where you're raising it, so why are you doing that? What is the difference you want to make? And it doesn't have to be the same purpose for the rest of your life, but one that makes sense for you now for the greater good. The second, uh, the other principle is oneness with nature, which is totally an experience. That is not something that we can read about and learn about and memorize. We have to have that experience. And so much in the big cities, uh, makes people unaware of that. They are missing that experience. When I talk about nature, many say, think of vacation. And they are not realizing that we are in nature, totally. We, not, we may not live in the park, but how about our food? How are we connected with our food? Uh, our food is not plastic, it's not synthetic, it is nature. So just reliving or um, starting a different relationship with nature, having that conscious experience. And the last, for, last one is uh, called mindfulness, which is interesting word because it's both a process and a result. Well, we can talk about developing more mindfulness, 
and be more mindful as opposed to automatic behaviors. And so much of our automatic behaviors are the ones that we do thoughtlessly. And that is exactly the, pol the, the polarity. Are we doing it like when we drive? We don't have to think, I have to shift now, I have to put my, uh, my foot in the clencher. It goes automatically, it's thoughtless, and it's okay. Until we are so thoughtless that we don't know that we for, forget to want forget to ask where well, where do I need to go first and then we end up driving in the wrong direction. So mindfulness is about being present, being fully present, and it is a practice and it's a result. So I share with you this, and now uh, it's a little bit. Uh, I want to take a few minutes talking about this. So what? What is the impact? Because what fascinated me with this is that I said, I found an easy way where we can make a big impact. When professors develop some aspects of these with their students, they're changing, influencing the lens through which these students will be looking at information, not only in their course, but in other courses. Because they will ask a professor that is teaching a strategy, well, what is the social impact of this? And maybe the professor never thought of it. And then now she has to think, well, let me think of that. So students are influencing, are changing their lens and they go out, they go in social media, they talk to other professors. If they're employed, they may be asking things or proposing things to their employer, have their own business, their family, friends, their community. The same faculty, when faculty start to develop a new mindset, they share it automatically because it's like a new way that we are thinking. And so we share, we have questions and uh, the impact Imagine the, the ripple effect this is causing. No? Through social media, it goes to employers, community. You can see it in, the, in that graph. As a matter of fact, I started a, a network, um, and you mentioned this in the beginning, uh, in about seven, eight years ago. And I said, well, let's get together with a few colleagues who are interested in this. It's the working group on the sustainability mindset now. And we started sharing, I started sharing the research, what I'm doing, seeing how they could incorporate it, what they were doing. And really this is becoming a reality. We did a, a survey last year and there were over 24 students, 24,000 students that we collectively were impacting. For those that we know, we do, that is the inner circle, the green one, because where they go afterwards and who they impact, we have no idea. But collectively, it was 20, over 24,000 in a year. In a, in a light survey, I mean, not, uh, we surveyed about 160 professors, men, members of the network, and maybe 120 responded. So there are a few others that didn't respond. But just to give you an idea, these are ripple effects where we are making a big change. So on the last slide, uh, in terms of resources, for those that, uh, and we will go into questions in a moment, for those that are interested, there is this prime working group on the sustainability mindset. If you want to connect with other colleagues from any discipline that are working or curious about this, this is a free working group. There is a sustainability mindset indicator an instrument to map and profile where an individual is on their journey and with guides for, for the individual and for the docent, for the professor to uh, help with activities. And so these are some uh, of the resources. And also on my website, there's a website for educators, so there are a number of resources. So what I would like now is to invite you to go to the chat and let's take a minute and uh, write down a question that is emerging for you uh, that you would like to share. And the reason that I am asking this is be be because when we say, oh, what are the questions? Those that talk first are the extroverts who talk and think at the same time. While the introverts need to be inside and connect with their own thinking before they can come up with a question. So to give everybody an equal opportunity, let's uh, uh, take a moment, maybe a minute, and go into the chat and write a question that you would like to share, um, that you would like to have answered by 
in the rest of the session. Okay. Thank you, Isabel. I actually have a question, and I have a question from myself, and I have a question from a guy from Singapore who could not attend because it's almost 1.30 1, 1 in the morning there. Oh. Now, my question is, you've mentioned this over many times, mindset, a mindset is personal. And if you have enough of a critical mass of people with this mindset, you would hope that this would reflect in, you have an expression called collective assumptions, mm -hmm. which is for me, collective assumption is really a culture. A culture is a social behavior or a norm. When you talk about a human being, it's a habit. When you talk about a, a community, it's a norm. Now, the natural question is, how would you take this kind of a mindset to become a culture? I think it's already happening, Ali, and not because of the work that we're doing, which is very small in the larger scope. But uh, I think it is, we already uh, are in a zeitgeist. There is something that is already shifting how we are paying attention to priorities. And it's not just uh, what we are doing here from the mindset, I say it again. I think a number of things came together. Uh, a few years ago, do you remember there was a volcano in Iceland? I think it was in 2013 that had a big eruption uh, and had a name that was impossible to pronounce in Icelandish, has a lot of consonants and accents. And, but that disrupted the air travel for 10 days. So planes were grounded all over the world. And I was fascinated. I said, now we are getting a lesson on interconnectedness in real life. Because otherwise, you know what you always said, volcano in Iceland. I don't even know where Iceland is on the map. Forget about saying that volcano. Now we realize how certain phenomena connect us. And COVID is another experience. That was a very strong experience that like we are connected. There was a guy on uh, talking about developing social sensitivity. He was on radio saying, you know, I never cared about people, uh, business owners paying for health insurance for their employees. I mean, that everybody can manage this on their own. I, I don't care if there is regulation or not. Everybody should make it at their best judgment. However, suddenly I'm thinking maybe we need to regulate this. Because now when I go to a restaurant and I see a server that is sick, but he doesn't have health insurance and now he has to come and work because he has no protection, he's infecting me. Now I am worried about his health. And you know, I think what is happening, everybody is getting a little bit of a lesson with this COVID showing, oh, I only care about myself, but now my, his health is related to my health. Oh, notice that. So it is developing. I am seeing this, and I'm sure you have been seeing it too among your colleagues, among the students. They start to look for other ways of understanding reality. Students, the younger they are, the more obvious it is. Of course we have to solve this. What do you mean maybe? Because it's their life. They cannot think how will we have a, uh, how will I have a, a family in five years? So the younger there are, the more obvious it is. And that I think is accelerating the pace. So I think it's already happening. Uh, well, maybe, maybe it's just it's the start of a wave, but I don't think we have what we might call a mass movement yet. It is still an outlier. It still did not form into complete wave. I mean, look at behavior of most people. Uh, let me ask you the, the, tell you the question of the guy. I mean, because it's interesting also. This is uh, Khairul Anwar, he's from Singapore. And he says some research has shown that being a vegetarian or eating a plant-based meat will help solve our environmental problems significantly. Will this practice affect the balance of the biological ecosystem of our planet? And he's saying, what are your thoughts, please? Mm. Um, when I was... Um... Uh, sharing with you the principles. It is about a new way of thinking. And what uh, your colleague is doing, he's already thinking, what are the pros? What are the cons? How is this impacting the ecosystem? Will it impact in a good way? Will it help here and damage there? What about the, uh, what about the cattle grow, uh, farmers? 
how are they getting so we are understanding the broader implications that means our consciousness is expanding we go from a smaller scope of caring just of me and my own uh, circle to broader scopes and that is this, this expansion of consciousness is really what is happening now and it is happening not like a blanket in everywhere at the same time but it's it's sort of bringing new standards and these standards are new expectations that are coming towards us interesting i think it's our generation the more the one that is more resistant if you talk to 12 year old or 15 years old they don't have many problems with making changes because it's not so much that they have to unlearn it's our generation that is a little bit well i don't know should i believe this is the hoax that these are the anchors of our identity when we are hanging on them and have not explored them sufficiently okay I'm going to tell, let people actually to ask their own questions and maybe show themselves. And I'm going to start with the same, with the order I'm getting in the, uh, so I'm going to start with uh, Katrina. Katrina, would you, would you unmute yourself, please? And, and... Okay, just a second. Uh, yes, I'm now on. Thank you, Ali. Very nice seeing you. Thank you for hosting Isabel tonight and wonderful presentation. And as I was listening to Isabel, I was wondering uh, who would be apart from just students and educators interested in promoting the concept of sustainability mindset outside to really create this critical mass that Ali, Ali was talking about. So I feel like we need to go wider. And if you can a little bit talk on that, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, this, my, my first answer is always yourself. Because that is the area of full control. We, when we say, oh, I wish politicians would do it. I think the uh, uh, lawmakers should do it. I wish the big uh, multinational. This is all other people. So if I start with my own area being very present, so what is it that I can do? So I may be writing to a newspaper and I may be influencing the newspaper because I write a letter to the editor, or maybe I uh, uh, write a blog, or maybe I do a Facebook conference and who knows who will be there. Maybe there's a politician or maybe I go and talk to someone. So when we start our biggest area of control, is the one that is most neglected. When we start to think, oh, we wish they would do it more. They would. That is where the big power and the influence that we have, we don't know how far it goes. And I have this exercise that you may have heard it before. Think of a person that meant a lot in who you are today and the person doesn't know it. Think for a moment. And you may come up with a name quickly. And that person had no idea he or she played such a role for you for being the person who you are, hopefully in a positive way, right? So that is the area of influence. We don't know how far it goes, but we can always operate within where we have our area of control. So if you say, where is the area of highest power? It's in ourselves and believing, it. I will do this. I will do this. What are my skills? What are my, my circles? Where I where I can speak. Okay, should we take a, a few more? Uh, yeah, we have Roland Bardi. Please unmute and, and ask your question. Uh, hello, Isabel. You know I'm an acolyte of yours, and I, I admire this. But my question has always been: um, uh, Why uh, do we? Or how can we influence in a in a transformational way if we are leaders in a company? Can we really um, change the mindset of our managers or can an employee who is an enthusiastic change the mindset of the managers above him? Uh, it, is it, it may be difficult uh, and you gave some answers, but uh, I, I asked the question once again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Roland. Well, uh, I think we have to uh, always start where the person is. So for example, in an organization, you have the competitors. Are you doing, are you keeping up with what your competitors are doing? Because they may be eating up your market uh, share because they are being more sustainable or at least promoting 
their green initiatives more than you are doing. So that's the first one. How are you defending your market share? So start where it hurts, market share, branding. What is the power of your brand? What if somewhere both at the social level and the environmental, uh, are you uh, being posted on social media for some behaviors that you're not very proud of? Oh, we better do something about this because that is hurting us. And the brand can be hurt very quickly. Liability. Every moment, uh, leaders are more liable because of the decisions they are taking, because not only the uh, legal actions that may be taken against them in the future, but also insurance costs, right? I, I, you see everywhere insurance costs are raising, and they raise even more if you have put your company into some kind of liability because of some uh, ignoring some, uh, some portion of the stakeholders. So it is, we are in a transparency age where no longer you can do it as long as no one knows it because it will be out there immediately. And so it has become a, a strategic liability. Thank you. Well, that's a good thing. So the push comes from there where it hurts more. It's a strategic thing if you want. Okay. Uh, Catherine Romero, please. Catherine. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the presentation, Isabel, and thank you, everybody. I have been reflecting a lot of um, about this idea of being present for the mind, mindfulness. Um, but uh, I, I have also the question is how we can focus on the present when there is a need of thinking in the future constantly and that produces anxiety and stress like you no know, getting jobs, buying a house, feeding the family, you no know, uncertainty, especially like it's happening right now in the pandemic. So how balance this fact of being present but also taking care of, of the future that we cannot control? Yeah. Well this is a, a very real tension that we're living and I as you well said, it's about balancing these, these different aspects. So it's interesting that when we uh, think of a, a word that really expands your feeling, no? like you may think, um, maybe you think music or beauty, or maybe you think cat, there are words that create feelings of joy and expansion. That is nurturing, is re releasing dopamine. These endorphins, these create a better balance. And then we come to the problem with a different, um, uh, like a, a different preparation. So when you work on being present and being centered, then you can face, it is not about uh, what are the challenges, that the challenges will be the challenges, how you react to the challenges. I want to share a very brief uh, story. We are getting these scams. My husband got, got a scam on the phone saying that uh, he had a charge of an iPhone of $700 on the credit card if it was him. And he said no. And uh, then the, the call dropped down. He said, I think it was a scam. So next day, the person, someone else calls and he recognizes that it's the same thing. So he says, oh, where, where's your accent from? Oh, I'm from India. Oh, India, and where? So the person says, oh, you know, I have not been there. Have you been to India? Yes, yes, my husband said, I've been to India. I have been here and here and there. Oh, and I love your country. Really, what do you love about the country? Oh, you know, I love the people and I love the food and I love the variety, blah, 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 blah. So they go on for five minutes or so. And then uh, my husband says, so tell me about this, uh, this uh, uh, thing that you were calling about uh, what is, uh, and the person stops and says, it is a scam. And so my husband said, yeah, you know, I thought so. So why are you working there? Well, you know, with the COVID, I lost my job in Dubai and now I'm doing whatever I can, but I feel really bad about it. I, it's, it's, I need to find something else. They created a human connection. The scam is the scam, you know, it's there. But he influenced something, something transformed because he authentically was present to that individual and didn't say, this is a person trying to cheat me. He, he looked at the person in a way. And with this approach, 
I don't know what happened to that, that person that evening, but something happened because it was a transformation in the moment. That's why I think that is when we are centered, we approach things in a different way, and then we create other impact. Okay. I, I, we, do you mind if we extend a little bit beyond the eight o'clock? If you go like eight not a problem for me. Okay. Well, I have a question. I have four questions uh, uh, that I would like to take. The first one is from uh, Dr. Uh, Yusreya Al Hamshari. Would you unmute yourself, please, ma'am? Hello. Please. Hello. Uh, thank you for, very much for this great presentation and for the uh, good topic you are dealing with. Uh, I'm just asking about uh, how uh, could I decide about the uh, idea of um, keeping good habits for my uh, mindset sustainability and how can I decide this is good for me or this is bad. Uh, I'm doing my habits according to my um, uh, interests and according to my needs and so on. So how can I decide that these habits are good for uh, sustaining my mindset or not? Uh, or uh, how can I build in another side of the question? How can I build uh, some good habits for uh, mind sustainability? Yeah. Well, um, I think uh, we all know when we are doing something that is good or bad. We have a, a wonderful compass, the best defense mechanism that we have is our intuition. However, we don't use it very much. We use other mechanisms of defense that are less good. So when we calm down, we have a lot of good judgment because we become an observer of ourselves. We can see ourselves doing something. So that is a wonderful practice and a guide that you can take everywhere because it's always with you. So you don't have to buy it or do anything special. It's always there, just waiting for you to pause. But we have to slow down because when we are doing things and we cannot access it, we have to be a little bit quiet. Then I think uh, uh, a nice exercise is going around your house and looking what are the things that you're using, consuming, huh? and just looking at them and saying, oh, I'm happy that I am uh, supporting this uh, industry or this person, or I'm not very happy. So what are my alternatives? Just looking at your daily behaviors, because that exercise is an exercise of becoming noticing. You don't, will not change everything, and maybe you don't have options, but you start noticing. It is, we are expanding our consciousness. That is the bottom line of what is happening with this. We are broadening our ex consciousness. And when we broaden our consciousness, we make different type of decisions. So just looking around. Hmm. Hey, uh, Raymond, please. Raymond Sanner, please. Yeah. Hello. <clears throat> um, thanks, Isabel. A, a very wonderful, uh, thoughtful presentation that gets me, I think, and many other people to, to become mindful mm. and, and, and more self-aware. Being in the position of te as a teacher, I was putting the question to you about how, how do you manage, uh, on one hand, advocacy for, let's say, uh, ecology and um, um, a, a sustainable future versus activism of, of uh, getting maybe the students and yourself involved in uh, um, ac actions mm. that go beyond the traditional role of the teacher? How do you manage these two uh, options? Yeah, I think you have to see what you can do in your context and do a little bit more because that is where you create change, right? If you just stay in what you have been doing. Project is a wonderful way for students to get this mindset in action, right? Because the only way that we would see it when it's in action and students want action all the time, we are not going to see it for them. They want to see what is it that I can do. And so for example, in uh, when uh, I 
asked them, I had an interesting experience with a colleague in Indonesia and she invited students, I don't know, there were over 200 on that call. And we said, okay, let's think of our areas of control and influence. What is one thing that you want to do that you think that you can promote? Uh, we use the SDGs as a, as a name. And so they could look, what is an area of my control where I impact the SDGs, where I could do something. And then they went on social media and they went and announced what they were planning to do and those that had the most likes uh, got a reward. I mean, that was a very interesting way to create a rapid expansion of, and they were so engaged. So these were little habits that they were talking. So from little habits to, uh, to passion projects that relate maybe with the school, with the community where they are, uh, I always uh, suggest that the projects be modest because uh, I, I remember a, a student in, uh, in Morocco, he said, oh, I have an idea for a project for this semester. Uh, and we had a, a semester, it was a summer session, so it was like 14 days. I want to reduce poverty in Morocco. And I said, okay, good. <laughs> let's get a little bit more modest. Because what happens is when we have the grandiose ideas, grandiose is the deception. And then with that comes the ego is hurt. And now I become cynical and all negative. And I feel powerless because I couldn't do anything. So let's start with something that is very modern where you can feel proud of what you do, but it's something that you can start and finish within this time. And the time could be your semester, could be a week, could be a day, it doesn't matter. You just set the time frame, and these are the boundaries. Now feel something that you could be proud. And I think these are very little things that are easy to do and that create a sense of, I can, I can, which is beautiful to, to instill that in, in, the, in use. Because many times when we start to share about the environmental things, just, I am so small, I am only 20 years old, I don't even have a job, a house, a, a car, nothing. What can I do? So we empower them. We leave them with the plant, the seed of self-confidence that can go big ways. So uh, it is the support that you bring them through what you show them in the question. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Hagar, Al-Fayed, please unmute yourself. Hagar? Hey, Professor. Uh, I wanted to ask what are some examples of recent innovation that are intended to make our to make our society more sustainable? These are very big words. And I think that uh, we have to go from the micro to the macro and back to the micro because our area of control and influence is always in the micro, but then it has impact on the larger. So if I would uh, ask uh, my, uh, I have a few colleagues here, uh, Ekaterina or Roland, what is something that you have done that was innovative and changed the society? They would say, oh my God, that doesn't sound so big. However, with many of their initiatives that I know about, they are influencing and making this a better place, whether instilling hope in their students, whether it's showing them that there are people that are doing things for the greater good and are being profitable at the same time, this exists by showing things sometimes, sometimes by promoting a different way of connecting with beauty and art like uh, Katerina is doing. So there are, Roland, when you go and give examples of what you have seen in your company. So I think we all are doing things in our micro level that have a large, make this world a better place. Now, if you want to see big things, well, for example, uh, automakers in the US have decided that they will go only uh, clean energy cars in the next 20 years. So that's a big thing. So maybe it's too late 20 years, but uh, we still need it. So there are big changes where industries are reacting to a movement that they all already see in their families because their kids or their grandkids are coming with a different way of thinking. So there's a big push. I think for a long time we have been 
trying that from top down, we get the instructions what to do. And now the forest is like a sandwich. It's so much coming bottom up, pushing, pushing with anger, some very angry, some very peaceful, everybody at their own way. But there is a push and that is what is moving us forward so rapidly. Yeah. Okay. We're going to take only one question for the sake of time. Uh, Ahmed Atif, please unmute yourself, sir. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you, Isabel, for your great presentation. Um, I'm just wondering about uh, do we have a connection between um, the future leaders and the sustainable mindset? Because actually, this is very important to point of me. Thank you so much, yeah. Uh, Ali, the sound was breaking up a little bit. Uh, he was, he was uh, asking, uh, how do you see the connection between sustainable mindset and future leaders? He was saying future leaders are a very important thing for the direction of yeah. countries and the globe. Yes. So how, what is the connection between the sustainable mindset and future leaders? Oh, I think the future leaders are already around us. I think we, uh, depending how we define the leader, right? But we are, there are thought leaders. There are young people taking a camera and showing, uh, sharing things on social media. They are showing, they are leading in a way. So we are leaders with our students. The students are leaders, maybe showing role modeling, new ways of thinking and new questions with their peers. So I think the future leaders are among us already. They are here. What I think, is the, the, the core point is how do we expand our consciousness? Everybody where there is, and you start where you are, but how can you stretch a little, a little bit more? How can you uh, address, for example, values in your classroom? And so that uh, the doing is not divorced and siloed from our deeper values. Because when we are talking about values, we all have wonderful values. And how can we make those the compass of our decision? And start talking about this, because when we don't talk about it, as if the, the system doesn't exist. When we start to talk, that now we have to live with, oh yes, we are doing this, but we are done. It's like this guy in the phone call that I said, he doesn't want to talk about this because he would feel horrible. However, there was a, a created a scene where he was not feeling threatened and he could talk. And I'm sure that by having talked about that, now he's thinking, I need to do something. I cannot live with myself. So just expanding our consciousness, connecting with the heart. Powerful. Isabel, I, I really thank you for a very insightful webinar, great discussions. I, I'm always impressed by your optimism and the way you look at things in a, in a more a positive way. Yeah. Uh, so I Ali, heard the other Ali, day, Ali, hope is a moral choice. Yes, and I like is. that. And I think we owe it to our students, to the next generation. We owe it to them. Sure thing. Sure thing. Uh, thank you again. And uh, I thank you all the audience for staying with us a little bit beyond the time. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. We, next week, we're going to have two speakers. On Monday, March 1st, we're going to have James Galbraith. He's going to talk about global inequality. Uh, Professor Galbraith is uh, he's, uh, in the University of Texas at Austin, at the, the government plus business relation, here in government and business relation. And he's going to talk about global inequality. He has some very interesting results. He's going to share it with us. On March 3rd, Wednesday, we have Anne Firth Murray. She's going to talk about women's human rights. Uh, Anne is consulting professor at Stan Stanford University, and she's the founding president of the Global Fund for Women. Thank you again. I thank Isabel. I, I, I mean, I cannot thank you enough, really, Isabel. Oh, my thank pleasure. You. Thank you for inviting me. So, anyone thank who wants to get in touch with the with the working group, they do it through you, and you can guide them. Sure thing. Sure thing. Have a good Thank night. You. Good evening, everybody. Thank you again. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.